Dr. Ted Dietrich, pupil of Houston surgical giants DeBakey and Cooley, inventor of the saw routinely used in open heart operations, today most commonly prescribes and performs procedures that bypass the bypass. All right, does that look good to everybody? Small tubular catheters are now Dietrich's tools of choice for entering the heart and blood vessels. Let's shoot the autogram now, please. Interspace scope and ultrasound okay. views have replaced direct visual access of arteries via yeah. large scalpel so incisions. Of your, uh, beautiful things about uh, the device. Now, the stainless steel operating, operating rooms right? of the past have given way to space age technology. And today, almost any vessel in the arterial circuit can be treated in a non-invasive manner. He's a 69-year-old man who had a six and a half centimeter aneurysm. Another ailment that has nearly every major medical device corporation at the drawing board for a non-surgical remedy is aneurysmal disease, most commonly found in the largest vessel of the body, the aorta. An aneurysm essentially is a, is a blister on your artery. It's much like a blister on your tire. And if that breaks, you can imagine what happens. You lose a lot of blood very quickly, and most often you die. And if you don't die uh, uh, and make it to the hospital, uh, very often you don't leave the hospital. The traditional operative treatment for aneurysms dates back to Dr. DeBakey's grafting techniques of the 1950s. In this graphic procedure, a large surgical incision is performed to expose the aneurysm. Now we've completely uh, dissected the aneurysm from its position. A prosthetic tubular graft is sutured to the healthy segments of vessel creating a new conduit for blood flow. It's still a very big operation. Usually you're in a hospital for, you know, a week to two weeks, and it takes anywhere from three weeks to two months to recover. The concept that with a, with a less invasive procedure we could repair this is very attractive. And essentially, the stent graft is, is what has allowed that to occur. You can see now that you've really placed this quite accurately relative to the renals. So Here at Fogarty Engineering, a team of physicians and engineers modify a new stent graft design on a human simulator, aptly nicknamed Angioplasty. You've got two centimeters of fixation, which should be a very good seal. Utilizing tubular graft material secured over spring-loaded stents, the device is delivered to the aneurysm inside a sleeve. The entire apparatus is snaked into the abdominal aorta, much like a balloon. Once positioned inside the weakened aneurysm, the sleeve is retracted and the stent graft parachutes open, isolating the blister from blood flow. It's attractive from a lot of standpoints. It, from the patient's standpoint, it's less risky. And from the standpoint of the insurer, the, the people paying the bill, it, it isn't going to cost as much. From the standpoint of the employer, the patient gets back to work earlier. So it's a technology that really benefits everybody. How are we doing, Chief? It is now 2.30 okay. in the morning. Got a wide open artery here. Two stents and have restored stents blood flow to in. the vessels feeding Frank well, Clemensburg's heart muscle. But the extent of injury to the muscle caused by the heart attack is unresolved. There's a fair amount of heart damage, and uh, a lot of this may come back, okay? This is too early to tell, and we're going to need several months down the road to tell how much of this heart muscle may actually come back. For many patients, this injury during heart attack is irreversible. Both conventional and endovascular treatments are to no avail. But once again, medical innovators have come to the rescue with new alternatives. You know what happened to you? I don't know what Few scientific advances would be more dramatic than the invention of the laser. It wouldn't take long for medical science to put laser to work in the operating room. By the 1980s, lasers joined the arsenal in the fight to open clogged leg vessels. Concentrated light energy began replacing the scalpel's blade, vaporizing deadly plaque. But follow-up investigations demonstrated that heat generated by the device could also damage healthy surrounding tissue, 
there's a lot of sort of tragedy in lasers, and I think that some of the early laser applications in the 80s actually set us back probably a decade. Uh, a good example of that would be the so-called hot tip laser, and it was actually too powerful. And people became so disillusioned with this, and there are about 250 of these lasers that serve as sort of trays for putting other equipment on in operating rooms, and it's one of the great white elephants of all time. The application of laser to reestablish blood flow in arteries had proven disappointing. But a new theory emerged. Rather than opening vessels, perhaps laser could be utilized to create new channels in the heart muscle itself. Uh, we at Stanford began working on a series of prototype devices that could be used percutaneously, like an angioplasty device. But instead of entering the coronary arteries, we actually enter the main pumping chamber of the heart with our catheters, a place that historically we've not really been as cardiologists. We usually don't work inside the chamber. We work through the arterial system. Bring a superior filter in, maybe bring this out a little bit more towards the apex. In this dramatic procedure called percutaneous myocardial revascularization, or PMR, a laser catheter is threaded from a blood vessel in the leg up into the heart. The into the heart is where PMR differs from angioplasty and stenting. Rather than running the catheter in the vessels on the surface of the heart, the PMR device is guided into the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. Once in place, the laser is applied to the wall of the chamber and activated. The laser drills only partially through the muscle, providing restored blood flow to heart tissue. To date, there's really been no treatment outside of complete heart transplantation for these patients who have such end-stage advanced coronary disease. And cardiologists and cardiovascular surgeons, as a rule, are people who don't tolerate failure. The cardiac frontier expands, galvanized by a spirited quest for newer and better treatments of cardiovascular disease. And while the tireless curiosity of medical innovators continues to be the primary catalyst for this progression, other modern influences have transformed the field as well. Medicare, Medicaid, HMOs, managed care, whatever kind of a scenario they're going to come up with, the bottom line is it's got to cost less. Uh, and endovascular surgery, uh, working in endoluminal technology, offers that cost reduction. Mr. Vandenberg? Yes, sir. How you doing? My name is Robert. Pretty good. Pretty good. Each day, Robert Regai sees the results of medicine's high-tech march. As a research coordinator for numerous FDA clinical studies, Regai compiles vital data on the efficacy of several emerging, less invasive devices. Um, here's my card, and I am the coordinator for the study. While working on one investigation, Rigai stumbled upon a potential treatment for a frustrating ailment that had plagued him since childhood. About 10 years ago, I started having symptoms of uh, ventricular tachycardia. And what that uh, was, was my heart was racing. Um, I didn't have any notice when it would happen, and uh, I would nearly faint. This is going to start recording on here, every, all the heartbeats that you have. Using a take-home EKG monitor, which recorded Robert's heart rate for a 24-hour period, the problem was detected. But this ailment had nothing to do with atherosclerosis. Rick I was a victim of a perplexing condition known as cardiac arrhythmia. I mean, everybody knows that the heart is a pump. It takes blood and it pumps it around the body and it delivers oxygen to the brain and to the rest of the muscles of the body. And, and that function of the heart is reasonably well understood by everyone. The problem is just like a car needs an electrical system in order to do all of its work properly, the heart has an electrical system as well. Buried within the tissues of the heart lies its own self-regulating conduction system. When operating normally, nerve-like cells generate electrical impulses, causing the chambers to contract. But when the system short circuits, the heart misfires, causing the heart to race or beat uncontrollably. In some cases, these arrhythmias slow the heart rate down to levels where blood flow can't oxygenate the blood sufficiently. Or the heart stops beating altogether. The most notable treatment for this condition is the long-practiced pacemaker surgery, 
These miniaturized electrical units are connected to leads that are threaded into the heart chamber to stimulate and manage pump activity. They run the show. The evolution of the pacemaker led to yet another life-saving advancement called the defibrillator, most commonly utilized by emergency crews to shock a heart back into action after it is stopped. But one resourceful cardiologist theorized that if miniaturized, these devices could also be implanted in patients to cure deadly arrhythmias. The defibrillator was, was really the, uh, the brainchild of a, of a physician named Michelle Murawski, who had a close friend of his die suddenly and decided that we really ought to be able to prevent this. His, uh, his vision is now widely recognized as, as placing him as one of the leaders in our field. Initially, however, uh, it was not recognized as a great advance, and, and many in the field thought that it was a bit of a screwy idea. Uh, in reality, and, and certainly what history has shown, is that it was far from a screwy idea, and he truly was a man of vision. This vision launched a new subspecialty of cardiac medicine called electrophysiology, or EP. The EP movement commenced with the refinement of defibrillator models and the techniques for implanting the devices. In the early days, these relatively large devices required an open chest procedure to implant. In the past decade or so, there have been remarkable advances in this technology. Not only do these defibrillators uh, are, have, have they lasted longer, they can be implanted without opening the chest. The surgical procedure itself is, is much more simple and can be performed by people who are other than cardiac or thoracic surgeons, making it much more available to a lot of patients. And it's become significantly less expensive to consider this technology. When we consider all the advances that have been made in the last 10 years, it's amazing sometimes to look back at what we were doing as little as 15 years ago. It's kind of like going back to the, uh, to the Stone Age. To give Robert Rigai's heart a new beat, Mattioni employed an even newer technique, one that did not require an implantable device at all. The procedure called catheter ablation utilizes high frequency currents to eradicate the wayward rhythm. The ablation catheter is threaded into the heart to the exact location of abnormal tissue. Electrical currents are delivered through the tip of the device, eliminating the deviant nerves from the circuit. Morning, Marilyn. Good morning. How are you doing? Just a few months morning, after his procedure, yeah. Robert counsels a new friend. 55-year-old arrhythmia sufferer, Marilyn Waldenmeyer. Yeah, do I understand that you've had this procedure? That's right. I had this procedure last January. How long did it take before you really realized that there was a change? Immediately. I left the hospital and uh, I have never had the symptoms again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. He cured me. Because yeah, I'm a lot older than you are and I've had it a long time. Really? How long have you had it? I was probably a teenager when I first noticed it. In the meantime, they kept saying, you're going to be fine, just live with it. Okay. It's kind of hard to live with. Yeah. Just 30 minutes later, Marilyn's procedure begins in the EP lab. In a scene straight out of a science fiction movie, Mattioni scans his multiple computer screens in search of the culprit. Robert looks on, this time as an observer. Mattioni uses stimulant medicines and electrical shocks to induce an irregular rhythm episode for observation. All right, that might, that might be it. After painstaking inspection, he identifies the exact location of Marilyn's problem. Yeah, we should go here. Yeah, go ahead. The ablation catheter is prepped and threaded into the heart. Looking good. The tip of the device is positioned at the area of abnormal tissue and activated for one minute. You gotta be. It's not gonna be any earlier. The catheter is removed and Mattioni once again tries to induce an arrhythmia episode. Looking good. After multiple attempts to generate an irregular event, the heart rhythm remains normal, confirming that the problem area has been short-circuited. Today, Marilyn Waldenmeyer is freed from a lifelong burden, the specter of hopelessness now gone. She will leave the hospital tomorrow due to the advancement of high technology tools and the talents of dedicated heart specialists.